the last time you recited a creed? Does the word sacramental make you wince? Let's talk about it with Aaron Damiani on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. And we're so glad you're here that you would take an hour out of your schedule and spend it with us means more to us than you know. And it might mean more to you than you know. By the way, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is here. Matthew uh, is our executive producer. He quit going to his gym. Now he says that not working out is not working out. (laughs) (laughs) An icon of discipline, uh, uh, Matthew is. And uh, then our producer, Jinx, is working hard in his little glass booth. Jinx is an entrepreneur. That's someone who says no to working 40 hours a week so they can work 80 hours a week. <laughs> buck 20. It was a buck 20 last week. Oof. Are there even 120 hours in a week? Yeah, no, that's too much. If you work very quickly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Metric. Our video director and one man IT department, John Myers, you don't see him, but he's there. In his tech bunker, John is still sick with COVID. I think he caught the Y2K bug that was going around for a while. And Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George wants you to know that there have been no, absolutely none, no documented cases of someone being bitten by a shark while they were making out a check. <laughs> and I don't want to say that there's a correlation there, but, you know, if you want to be safe. <laughs> and everybody that's been bitten by a shark, and there are a lot of them of late, were not. Right. There you go. Check. There you go. Or swiping their credit Wise cards. Is the, is the soft feminine side of the program. Kathy just celebrated her birthday, and in her wisdom, she has started getting rid of things she doesn't need anymore, like hopes and dreams and (laughs) optimism and things like that. Yeah. (laughs) Gotta go sometime. This is a different program, and if you think you know what it's about because you read something on the website, you don't know nothing. This is going to be so different than you think it's going to be. Father Aaron Damiani uh, serves as the lead pastor of Emmanuel Anglican Church in Chicago. He writes and speaks regularly about spiritual formation, leadership, and recovering the gifts of the ancient church for today's challenges. Aaron's newest book, uh, which I now hold in my nicotine-stained fingers, is titled Earth Filled with Heaven, Finding Life and Liturgy, Sacraments, and Other Ancient Practices of the Church. And you're saying right now, now that sounds exciting. I think I'm going to go get a beer. (laughs) Don't you dare. Because you're in for learning stuff that's going to make a difference in your life. Aaron, a number of uh, a number of times, I've taught uh, the contemplatives of the church and their writings to seminary students. And one of the things I said to them is that the devotional life of the people in their church won't work for them. Uh, seminary has robbed them of that. You can't use our daily bread. You've got to find something deeper and more profound. And I introduce them to some of the desert fathers and the, and the, uh, the fathers of the church and even liturgy a number of years ago. 
uh, my well was running dry. Nobody told me about that when I was in seminary, but it was just getting old and boring. And I was thinking about becoming a Buddhist. My mentor at that time, John Stanton, gave me a copy, an old falling apart copy of the Book of Common Prayer from the Church of Scotland. And I uh, started using that. And I didn't understand what was going on. I really didn't. But I knew something had changed in my life. I used to visit hospitals and the Catholic plea priest would, if I was there, would put his stole on and use a prayer from uh, his liturgy and his heritage. And I would use my common Norman evan normal evangelical prayer. And I used to think he's very fortunate, but I didn't know why. But as I've read your book, I've kind of seen what happened to me. Uh, and uh, it was a good thing. You were at Moody Bible Institute. I don't think of Moody. I love Moody, but I. I don't think of it as a bastion of liturgical worship, nor <laughs> of a place where the church desert fathers and the church fathers are uh, studied extensively. What happened to you, man? Did you, I, somebody committed suicide, right? That was kind of new. That'll shock you. Uh, talk to us about you. And where you come from, how did you get to be an Anglican and wear a collar and be called father? Well, uh, it actually did start in a similar place as some of the themes you mentioned, where I was just in an epic uh, sort of drying out of my soul. The learn more, do more treadmill uh, worked for a while, actually. It helped me grow spiritually. But as I continued in my theological studies, I began to have doubts about what I believed. I felt like a bad Christian for that. Um, like you said, one of my close friends at the time, their father took his own life. He was a devout Christian. That was a confusing experience for me. A lot of desolation that didn't quit, quite fit in a uh, upbeat mega church worship experience. I didn't know where to take that lament. And then I was in my first ministry assignment, just having the time of my life until I wasn't. And it was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was beginning to take more than it gave when the criticisms came in. I didn't know how to process that. So I was burned out. Uh, I was, I couldn't feel my way to God anymore. I couldn't think my way to God anymore. And I couldn't serve and minister my way to God anymore, but I longed for God. And so at the, you know, around that time is when I stumbled through the doors of a Presbyterian church, a bit of a hot mess. But I discovered that, you know, the church could be like a mother. She could take in weary travelers and teach them how to pray and give them the, uh, the good meal, the nourishment, not only of the word of God, but of the, the word of God put in visual form in the sacraments. And that helped me bring my lament uh, and my hunger to God again. And it sort of was a bottom up experience from there. It was exciting, wasn't it? It's, uh, I can remember those days. They were, you know, I was learning stuff I never knew before that nobody ever taught me. And I was feeling, I took communion um, most mornings. And, you know, Presbyterians and Calvinists think that's abhorrent, that you just don't do private communion. And I was, somebody found out I did. I didn't tell anybody, but... Uh, um, I had a bottle of wine. If you use grape juice and put it in your office, it gets all kinds of stuff that grows on it. <laughs> and I often thought if I, you know, if I died or something and they were cleaning out my office and found that wine, they would say, that explains a lot. <laughs> and now we understand. <laughs> but at Presbytery, they wanted to discipline me. And they said that, uh, we understand you take private communion. And I said, mm. well, yeah. And I remember the guy standing up and he had his finger up. And I said, but so did Spurgeon. Mm. And I got it from him. Mm. And he said, Spurgeon. Oh, and he sat down. <laughs> and I decided then if you can quote Spurgeon or Calvin or Martin Lloyd-Jones, 
<laughs> in any heresy in which you're involved, you get a pass. <laughs> it's an awesome pro tip. I'm going to save that. <laughs> Aaron, I'd be, what are you serving as a Presbyterian missionary to Anglicans or what? More like the other way around. Uh, my, my friend Chuck Colson calls it Presbyteranglican. Um, <laughs> and so I, I minister to the Anglo curious. Um, so, so I am an Anglican now, but, um, but have many good friends in the Presbyterian church. And um, you really are a man of prayer, aren't you? Um, only when God gives the grace to pray. Um, but I do find that the, actually the gift of prayer that's been given to me is something where I can just join in the stream. I don't have to conjure it up. And that's one of the greatest gifts for me is just being able to take those old prayers and, you know, integrate them into my own broken life. So I'm grateful for oh, that. Man. Oh. Hey guys, don't you go anywhere. Uh, cause we're going to come back like Jesus. And like Jesus, we've got some stuff to tell you that if you haven't been to this place, if you haven't understood, this could be some life-changing times. So don't go anywhere. The name of the book, by the way, is Earth Filled with Heaven. Finding life in liturgy, sacraments, and other ancient practices of the church. This is hard work, we gotta rest, but as I said, we're coming back. Aaron Damiani, and uh, his latest book is called Earth Filled with Heaven, Finding Life in Liturgy, Sacraments, and Other Ancient Practices of the Church. And you got to get this book. It's not what you think. Uh, you think that a book with that kind of title is one you should have in your library when you have a flood. Because if you stand on it, you'll stay dry. <laughs> but it's not. It's uh, a profound book and an important book. Aaron, um, I as soon as I saw, I don't remember how algorithm or whatever, saw it on Amazon. I was immediately drawn to this. It looked like it's very accessible, very interesting to me. I grew up uh, Baptist and... It's it's a different space than this, you know, yeah. like talk about like, I don't know. Are we talking about evangelism of the explosion? What do you know? <laughs> like, what, what's a, what's sacrament and all this stuff? So for somebody who's listening, who really doesn't even have maybe a passing understanding of some of these things, is it possible to kind of just get a 30,000 foot view on what are some of these uh, sacraments and liturgical pieces that you're that you're talking about? Absolutely. So just to cover sacraments and liturgy, um, you know, one thing that I saw when I was on my bike recently was a deer crossing sign. And it just immediately sort of like made me alert. I don't want to be hitting any deer, you know, on my bike. And so um, one thing that one way to understand the sacraments is that they're a signpost pointing to a greater reality. Maybe you can't see it right now. Um, but they help you see it. They help you be on alert for it. So the Lord's Supper, sometimes referred to as the Eucharist um, and baptism are like signposts that help us see God is has come to dwell with man. His grace is for them. And um, liturgy is something that we do with our bodies that shapes our souls, whether it's swiping right on your phone or saying the Lord's Prayer while holding hands with your brothers and sisters in your small group. And so um, liturgy is the work of the people, but it works on the people. It tends to shape you and form you. And that can either be for good or for bad. And liturgical churches, what they do is they try to take scripture and make it singable and prayable so that it gets in your bones and circulates through your system and, and shapes you to be a disciple of Jesus. That's great. That's great. You know, I... Um... There are times, and everybody knows what I'm talking about, when you just can't pray. 
Yes. They say, you know, I'm upset, but I'm prayer and I got peace. That's nonsense. Right. Well, it's not nonsense. It happens sometimes, I suppose. But mm -hmm. there are times when I'm really scared or really lonely or dealing with hard stuff when prayer is the hardest thing in the world to do. And that's when I let somebody else pray for me. And it makes a difference. George. Um, yeah, Aaron, actually two thoughts came to mind. One was it, um, my impression is it's, it's like, um, people moving toward, especially younger people moving back toward more liturgical type churches and so forth. It seems like a real trend, if you will. And, um, secondarily, I don't know, not related necessarily, but you devote a chapter, um, to uh, the topic of time and how that fits in with uh, the kind of the sacramental liturgical perspective. If you could kind of expand on that too, uh, you know, most evangelicals are barely familiar with the idea of a church calendar or whatever, mm -hmm. but just what, how some of that relates. Yeah, great questions. You know, just real briefly on the uh, the young people piece. There are a lot of young people that are coming in to to Anglican churches, and uh, a fair amount at you know at Emmanuel Anglican who are new to it. And in my conversations with them, what I find is that they're going through a similar experience that that Steve was describing, where you're you're wanting to be spiritually fruitful, but you're bearing more responsibility. It's getting harder to to bear fruit in the cultural conditions that we have. And so they're kind of like that Psalm one tree, or that Jeremiah 17 tree, sending their roots as deep as possible to get access to the nourishment that can allow them to, you know, be a Christian in the age we, we live in. Um, and one of the things that really helps is what you mentioned, which is the, the church calendar, the way that we mark time, our days, our weeks, our years. And, you know, the default way of marking time and, and shaping our calendars is, you know, we shape our days for productivity and we shape our years for consumption, but that ends up shaping us, you know, that, that ends up making mm -hmm. us feel like we're performing all the time or we're, it's, you know, feast or famine. What the liturgical year does, you know, whether it's the, the day, the week or the year is that it, it actually marks time according to God's grace. And it, it invites us not to performance, but to pauses in the presence of God. And then the, the year gives kind of an epic, but yet a beautiful way for us to walk together to the cross, the resurrection and the life of the church. So it ends up shaping us to, to love God's kingdom rather than, you know, just to be able to love productivity as wonderful as productivity is, or to mm -hmm. love consuming experiences as, as wonderful as, as, as those can be giving gifts and receiving them, et cetera. So there are like, from the day perspective, there are is it daily offices, uh, the, you know, times of prayer and so forth during the week, obviously. And from an evangelical perspective, we think of that. Yeah, we go to church on Sunday and then the year, um, you know, not just Christmas and Easter, but other parts Ember of the days. year. Any anything else to add on that aspect? Yeah. You know, it's uh, if you think about the day, it's the, it's learning the rhythm, you know, the rhythm of actually starting your day at night where you're you're celebrating that God continues to work, even though you're going to sleep. And then when you wake up, you're waking up into grace. You're waking up, you're joining what he's already been doing. And the week you think of the Sabbath as kind of a cathedral in time where it it actually gives shape to your work, uh, where you realize that all of this is meaningful yeah. And then the year it's, it's going to take you through key parts of the gospel, whether it's the second coming of Christ, the revealing of Christ's glory, um, his 40 days in the wilderness, as well as his final week in Jerusalem and, and everything that led to. So there's, it's, it's, it's textured, but also it's pretty simple as well. And the church provides the resources that we need to, to sort of be, be, be able to mark the days, the weeks and the year. Mm -hmm. This, um, are people wired differently? So there's some Christians for whom this will be less uh, uh, important than for you or for me? I think so. I, as I've talked with people, I realize it's it's probably not for everybody. And there's different 
levels that this connects with with people. And so um, there's just grace for that. There's actually freedom to embrace the tradition that you know we've been we, we've been given, and um, to to let those who are ready to go deeper to go deeper. Mm. Good answer. Mm. Hey guys, we're uh, talking with Aaron Damiani and uh, the book uh, Earth Filled with Heaven. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Finding life in liturgy, sacrament, and other ancient practices of the church. As I told you before, this is very hard work and we have milk and cookies and uh, little cots where we can take a nap. (laughs) We're gonna do all of that. And then once our energy is restored, we'll pray and come back. have a place at our table uh we're excited by the way to let you know something we've been working on it's the key life audio bible project that's a family uh, fancy way of saying me reading the entire books of the bible uh man it is hard uh, <laughs> to sit down and to just read god's word without constructing a sermon. I get all these ideas and it my tongue gets tied and I want to preach and I can't do it. And uh, this has been good for me and it might be good for you. We've done three or four of the books of the New Testament. And if, if you're interested, uh, you might want to check it out. Good. When you read, when you read uh, Jude, when you came out of the studio, you said, oh, no, that I really like that book. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most obscene gesture book in the New Testament, man. It'll keep you awake at night. You don't want to read it for your devotions before you go to bed. So if you go to that link on our website, you might want to skip Jude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unless you're a... Uh, <laughs> sadist and uh, <laughs> or something uh, Aaron um, do you um, what do people in your background uh, the churches you've attended and been a part of and been involved do they think that you've gone weird on them or do they look at you and are thinking I wish I had something like that you know what? Um, if they think that it's it's weird and crazy, they just don't tell me that uh, because they're you know nice Midwesterners. Uh, but actually, I have heard a lot of the of the second response, which is this: this is compelling. We want to know more. We want to go deeper. And you know, my posture is like I love my evangelical heritage. I I I love the actual people of my evangelical heritage as well. I still know them and interact with them and. I actually think when I look back on being at Baptist Bible churches, et cetera, I see sacramental qualities to our mm. way of life. Um, and I think to be evangelical actually is to be quite sacramental, even if you don't call it that. So, you know, I, I approach it very much like let's have a conversation where we respect where each other are coming from, but for the most part, people want Jesus Christ And so if there's an ancient way to see, savor, walk with Jesus Christ in his church, I generally find people are for it and they're, they've been very kind and respectful about it. What uh, would you suggest if somebody's watching or listening on the radio stations and uh, this is fairly new, I mean, they're hearing things they haven't heard before. Uh, what are some resources that you would, and of course, your book, uh, that goes without saying, but uh, 
Are there other resources they have to look for? What would you suggest? Where would you suggest they go? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, one encouragement would be, you know, if you are in a healthy, vibrant local church where Jesus Christ is being preached, stay there. Don't don't leave your church um, because the church actually is the place to practice this uh, this way of life together, even if it's not heavy on liturgy or doesn't do sacraments often. Um, the church is beautiful, and I want people to remember that. But as an individual, if you want to bring in more liturgy, creeds, and ancient prayers into your prayer life, one real simple way you can do this, I think there's a daily office app that you can download. I, it's not associated with me. I don't even know who put it out, but it's great because you open the app and it will give you the prayers for the morning, the afternoon, the evening. You open it up, it just intuitively knows what time it is. And uh, you just scroll down and follow the, follow the confession, the reading of the scriptures. One simple thing people can even do tonight is that you can light a candle at dinner to celebrate that the light of Christ shines, even though the sun has gone down and pray an ancient prayer. One of the oldest prayers out there is called Oh Gracious Light. And just Google Oh Gracious Light, pray that as you light the candle. Maybe there's some roommates or family members around the table and just celebrate that God's grace is shining over your life and over the world. Hmm. Those are... Uh... Cool. That turns the fire down, and most of us, and we're living in a culture where we're disliked for yes. what we believe to be true, uh, where we're very busy trying to make an impact on the world because they told us that's why we were created. Uh, we're not only tired, we're afraid, and then all the doubts start coming in. And this is kind of like bringing a ship. You know the prayer, the ocean is so big and my boat is so little. Uh, bringing the boat into a harbor that is quiet and still and yes. real. Mm -hmm. And um, there are varieties of ways. We're not saying that you have to be an Anglican. Uh, and I loved what you said, Aaron, if you're in a church... Uh, that's an evangelical and they're clear on scripture and Jesus is exalted don't go anywhere else it could be a whole lot worse yes but there are places you can go and just be quiet yes be still and to meet him in a profound and deep way this book will be helpful to you you ought to get it and read it especially if this is all kind of new to you. The title of the book is Earth Filled with Heaven, Finding Life in Liturgy, Sacraments, and Other Ancient Practices of the Church. And whatever, it can't hurt. <laughs> hey guys, we're gonna back out for a bit, sell product, come back. Thanks for spending an hour with us. Um, uh, and uh, we're talking to Aaron uh, Damiani. <laughs> he tells me I'm getting that right, but my dyslexia gets into it, and it's <laughs> very easy. I bet people say your name in a lot of funny ways. <laughs> but Aaron's creative. written a great book, Earth Filled with Heaven. Um, thanks for being with us. In case you don't know, Key Life added a new podcast this year. It's called Simply Sermons. You can find it on the Key Life app, on your favorite podcast platform, or at keylife.org, Simply Sermons. Kathy? Um, Aaron, I was, I was thinking and getting ready to ask you a question kind of around this kind of general subject. You know, when um, people who kind of tend to hold these uh, liturgies, ancient practices, whatever you want to call them, kind of like at uh, arm's length. What is the reason for that hesitation? And then right before the next to the last break, somebody asked the question uh, of, to you, is this for everybody? And you said no. And um, I couldn't help but think about, and Matthew alluded it, 
alluded to it because of his Baptist background. And mine was very evangelical, very, I mean, pushing fundamentalism and all that kind of stuff. So there was no room for anything like that because, and and I do have to say it just outright. I mean, that's just what Catholic people do. We don't do that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, we're more real, you know, we don't have to recite stuff that somebody else wrote for us and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I'm wondering if the reason um, that people hesitate to reach out toward this has in fact a lot to do with their background, what they perceive this to be and the lack of real understanding for it. And, and I ask you that because I'm a really good example of that because I, in the last year or so have changed churches and there's a a lot more liturgy. And one of the earliest things I struggled with, I come out of churches my entire life where you have communion the first Sunday of the month. I mean, that's it. Well, and then you have Christmas Eve and you have good uh, Monday, Thursday, of course, but that's it. I mean, and there's something almost like religiously proper that you have to do it the first Sunday of every month. I'm still after almost two years of being a member of this church. I'm trying to figure out what the schedule is for communion because we do it all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can do it two or three weeks in a row and then all of a sudden not do it for two weeks. And then we're I mean, there's no, you know, schedule. And that's minor. But I'm just learning to like say, wow, this is just and I love it every time it happens because we go forward. Go figure. You know, yes. and um, and are spoken to on an individual basis um, with liturgy. But wow, mm. it's just an amazing thing. Do you think people are afraid of it because of preconceived ideas about what it means? Are they turning away from the faith <laughs> by doing some of that stuff? That's kind of how I felt. I mean, when I saw people wear robes, I was just like, what in the world is happening? And yeah. am, I, am I a, am I like being naughty? by being in this church, <laughs> um, you know, which has an appeal to some people. Uh, and and so I think it's been given a bad name, you know, a bad brand as it were of like, this is only for Roman Catholics trying to earn their salvation. It's a place of idolatry. It's a place of um, smells and bells and works righteousness. And if you really love Jesus, you're going to, you're going to get out of there. And I think that the the complexity of that is, you know, when you read about the Reformation, it was like, well, there was a lot of works righteousness and abuse of power and ridiculous things that needed real reform in the the Reformation era. Um, I think that what that misses, though, is that the reformers themselves were sacramental and that they loved liturgy. They loved the sacraments. They treasured it. And so I think, you know, an irony for me is that the um, the people who wanted to put the word of God in the language of the people have gotten to the point where it's not just liturgy that they've thrown out sacraments, but also even the basic things like the public reading of scripture has now been evacuated just so you can have more time for the preacher to preach. And I love preaching. So it's been given a bad name. And, and I think that the, the, you know, the counterpoint to that is like, this is a treasure for all Christians. This is a treasure. It's a treasure chest, you know, filled with delights and wonders that will enrich your faith. And it doesn't just belong to classically liturgical uh, denominations. Mm -hmm. Is there a, is there a danger, and, and this danger is everywhere because it's in our DNA, of this just becoming empty ritual, something oh. that you got to do because if you don't do it, then God won't bless you. And so you got to say the right prayer at the right time in the right way, and God have mercy on you if you don't kneel. Is there a road that can go there that's kind of dangerous? Absolutely. You know, any good and healthy practice of the Christian faith can get corrupted by the law, by the, the the spirit of legalism. And it's so much of it is in how we practice it and why we practice it, not just what we're doing, but why we're doing it. And so, you know, growing up evangelical, having my quiet time every day had a little bit of that. And I'm not blaming anyone for that, but it was, for me, it was a way to, to perform. Having an emotional experience in worship can be works righteousness. Serving the poor, doing evangelism can take on a spirit of like, if you, if you would just do this with the right amount of passion and the right amount of fruitfulness, 
then God would be happy with you. But if not, he probably isn't. So we've got to be careful. Anything we do, including liturgy, which we can experience as grace filled for a season. And then, you know, the flesh wants to earn. And so it can certainly become something it can rust and become works righteousness. And we've got to guard against that. How do you, I mean, we just have another minute, but how do you guard against it? I think, you know, for me personally, the way that I guard against my leadership getting corrupted by my flesh is by confessing my sins uh, in close relationships with my, my uh, brother pastors, people in my life who, who know my soul. I think that as our souls stay healthy and we are acknowledging our own tendency to, uh, to go the way of, um, of, of, of sin, um, then the grace of God can flow through us. And as it does, you know, those refreshing streams of the Holy spirit that flow through liturgy, but also flow f- through just healthy confessional relationships. Um, we'll be less likely to wag our finger at people who aren't doing the liturgy right or who don't like it as much as we do or don't know all the special little practices of how to, you know, how to how to make the sign of the cross or all the different liturgical phrases that the insiders know. We just got to guard against pride and insiderism that um, is a temptation for us all. Oh, Aaron, this has been a great hour and a great book. You ought to get it. You ought to read it. Uh, and you, we, we've loved having you on, and we appreciate your taking your time to be with us. You keep writing, and we'll keep talking. <laughs> Thanks very much. Guys, uh, we're going to back out, and we're going to come back for a short visit uh, at the end of this break. And Catherine Wyatt is going to tell us who we're going to do it unto next week. And as always, you will be astounded and amazed. So don't go anywhere. Thanks for being with us during this hour. And if you stayed with us, you're glad you did too. The truth is we're all too busy. And, you know, you live in our kind of culture and things have changed rapidly. And I've watched it all. When you're as old as I am, man, you feel like you're spinning. And uh, and you got to have a rock. You got to have an anchor or something. You got to have a way where you tell the world, shut up. I'm going to spend some time with Jesus, and I don't give a rip what goes on while I'm doing it. And if I don't do that, I'm going to die. Now, you might do it the way Aaron does. What a winsome young man. You might do it the way your local Baptist pastor does, or your charismatic, or your Roman Catholic. But guys, we have got to stop. Remember who we are. Spend time with the one who is our closest friend. And one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways is uh, in what Aaron was talking about during this program. It's a good book and uh, it's a good thought to say that uh, when we come into his presence and set everything else aside, sometimes Jesus says, child, Glad you're here. I've missed you. And we've missed him too. And the most important thing we can do in this kind of cultural, busy, social media environment uh, is to be still and to know that he is God, that he's there, that he cares, that he loves us. Kathy, who's going to be on next week? 
Next week, our friend uh, Ken Harrison, who is the CEO of Promise Keepers, will be with us. Um, and his new book that's just recently come out is A Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. <laughs> Daring Faith in a Cowardly World. This is a this is a get it done. He's been my friend for a hundred years, but he's a get it done guy on steroids, which makes him sound like a legalist, and he's not. He gets grace, but you have to keep reminding him when you talk to him. I spend a half an hour with him, and I feel guilty. <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't have spent this half hour. There are things to do and places to go, but it'll be of great benefit what's happened with Promise Keepers. Hey, we're out of here, uh, and we'll be back next week, same time, same place. And it's our fond hope that you'll join us same time, same place. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth. <laughs> <laughs>